church um i just want to welcome everybody our regular members it's so good to see all of you and our other virtual members who may be being from youtube um we'll be starting our service off with our opening prayer which is 570 not not i but christ and then it'll be followed by the pastoral prayer the meditation item and then the speak of the Hour, which is Elder Carey. Thank you. <laughs> Not I, but Christ. Exalted, not I, but Christ, be seen, be known, be heard. Not I, but Christ, in every look and action. Not I, but Christ, in every thought and word. Not I. Christ to gently soothe 
soothing sorrow, not I, but Christ, to wipe the falling tear. Not I, but Christ, to lift the weary burden. Not I, but Christ, to hush away all Christ only, Christ, no idle words here falling. Christ only, Christ, no needless bustling sound. Christ only, Christ, no self-important bearing. Christ only, Christ. No trace of I be found. No. Not I, but Christ, my every need supplying. Not I, but Christ, my strength and help to be. Christ only, Christ. For body, soul, and spirit, Christ only, Christ, here and eternally. Good afternoon, Church. It is my privilege to lead us in the pastoral prayer. I would encourage you all to adopt a position of reverence where it is possible, please kneel, or you may remain seated, but we are gonna be bowing our heads and closing our eyes. So please, can we all be prepared to seek the Lord in prayer? Dear Father in heaven, I wanna thank you for the privilege that is the Sabbath day. Thank you for giving us the breath of life this morning and giving us the chance to fellowship Thank you, Father, for loving us and continuing to watch over us and protecting us in this week that has just gone so that we may be with you and acknowledge the Sabbath day and rest in your presence. Father, we just want to put before you the needs of our church family, those that are close, those that are far, those that we see regularly, those that we haven't had a chance to see in person for such a long time. And Father we, Father, we pray that you will extend a healing hand over those that are in need of comfort and those that are in need of the almighty physician. Father, we just ask that <clears throat> although our church family may be scattered and we have not had a chance yet to see each other physically, that through these technological means over YouTube and through Zoom, that everyone may be touched by your presence, knowing that they are truly loved and we can embrace and care for them as our church brethren. Father, we just wanna put before you the speaker of the hour, Elder Otis Carey. We pray that you will put in his mouth, put in his heart, the words that you would have us to hear this day. Father, we know we are living in troublesome times and everywhere we look, we are seeking guidance, support and love. We are looking around us and there may seem to be many foes, many enemies. And Father, we just want to find comfort and solace and refuge in your word today. Father, we just ask that the message, let it enrich our hearts. Let it help us walk closer with you. Help it plant a seed in those that hear it. Help it plant a seed in their hearts so that they may allow that seed to take deep root and blossom and grow and mature so that father we can have that joy that that awesomeness that it comes to have that relationship with you so that it is visible to all let a light shine forth and let us all be known to be followers of your word father we just submit before you all our needs those of, that are old those that are young the sick the bereaved wherever it may be father we know that as we kneel before your throne before we have even asked for it you are able to provide the needs of those and we know father that you see the desires of all of our hearts and father we just ask that in your time whenever it may be that you may grant unto us all our wishes and desires father we pray that as we commune together on this sabbath day that we will have the opportunity to witness and hear a message that is 
going to light our hearts, Father, and, and give us hope for whatever is to come. Father, we submit before you in this way and pray that you will watch over us, keep us, bless us, and keep us again for the following week so we may come together again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. church good afternoon can you hear me by a show of hands can you hear me super duper fantastic welcome to our members welcome to those of you who are watching online on youtube it is my great privilege to be able to break the bread of life with us today the topic on the consideration this afternoon I'm going under the title, Despise Not Prophesying. Despise Not Prophesying. I'm very, very excited to be able to share this message with you today. As some of you might know, I have had this message waiting and looking and hoping to share it for maybe, I don't know, a couple of years now. But up until now, God never really gave me the permission to speak it. But on this occasion, I have been given the license to speak the message. 
we will have a word of prayer and then I will share with us our scripture readings and then we will head straight into the message. I encourage you to get a pen, a pencil, some paper, get a Word document, get something to write down the things that I will share with you today and then to go and look them up for yourself. Many of the truths that I'm going to share with you today, I learned many, many years ago. I was fortunate enough to attend a revival series in Ladywood. And the preacher was a pastor, Jason Morgan, formerly of Amazing Facts. And he preached a two or three week series, I believe it was. But so successful and so much in demand he was, he agreed to stay behind and to do one extra day, one additional day on a Sunday. And the truths that I'm about to share with you are the truths that I learned that day. I have never heard these things preached before or since. And I wish that I had taken a pen and I wish that I had written the things down. Because if I did, it would not have taken me many, many years of my own study to re rediscover the truths that he shared. So I encourage you to write these things down and look them up for yourself. Let us pray. Before we pray, before we pray, one more thing. As I speak, I'm, I'm encouraging you to pray for yourself and to pray for me. Pray for me that I would speak only the things that God has ordained for me to say to you. And then after having spoken God's truth, I pray for yourself that you would hear and you would respond to what God is telling you to do. One more request I have for you all. I know sometimes when we are on Sabbath school or when we are on in divine service, I see some of you texting each other backwards and forwards, giggling and laughing and making jokes. I can't tell you what to do, but I'm, I'm requesting kindly, please don't do that. It's very distracting. It's very distracting. Thank you very much. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we come, we come with nothing worthwhile of our own. But Lord, it is only by the grace and the mercy of, of you, Lord, that we can approach yourself. Only in the the person of Jesus Christ, can we come near unto a righteous and a holy God. Lord, I pray that you would bless us, bless the hearers, Father, bless me, speak to me and through me. Lord, there's nothing in my mind that is worth sharing with the people, but you, Lord, you have all truths. Please speak with us today. Lord, I pray for the technology, I pray for my hay fever, Lord, all these things, I put them in your hands, asking that your name will be glorified here today. In Christ's name, we ask all of these things. Amen. Two scripture readings to share with you today. Let me try and share my screen so that you can see them too. Fantastic. The first scripture is taken from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Verses 19 to 23, it reads, quench not the spirit, despise not prophesyings, prove all things, hold fast that which is good, abstain from all appearance of evil, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The next scripture is taken from the book of Amos. Amos chapter three, verse seven, a familiar text. It says, surely, surely the Lord will do nothing, but he revealeth his secrets unto his servants, the prophets. And so today, as we continue in our revival series, I would like to talk about God's prophetic pattern. God's prophetic pattern. Now, we are reminded in this text here in Amos that God never leaves his followers in darkness. God raises up kings and destroys kingdoms. 
He sends flood. He sends rain. He sends into captivity. He sets captives free. He sent his son to the earth once and he will soon come again. And in all of these things, God always reveals his plans to his prophets. And today, what I want us to see is that there is a clear pattern to how God uses these prophetic messages and his servants, the prophets. I found a very interesting quote this week. So, we, you know, what, what is prophecy? What is prophecy? You may have different ideas. I found an interesting quote in the Lexham Bible Dictionary. It says that, although the word prophecy often evokes images of people who predict the future, Hebrew prophets primarily anticipated the punishment of evil and or a better life on earth for faithful Israelites. They spoke the truth about the present and what would happen if people did not change their behavior and return to Yahweh's ways. And so put simply, it's saying that one of the primary purposes of a prophet in the Bible is not merely to predict the future, but it's to give a message of warning to God's people. The primary purpose of a prophet in the Bible is to tell God's people to change their ways or receive of God's punishments. This is a really key fact which must not be missed. It mustn't be missed. Something else I want us to see about the, the prophetic pattern in the Bible is that when a Bible prophet, when a prophet of God is speaking, they are not speaking their own words. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 19, verse 10, and I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, see thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And so, According to what we just read, prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. If you read in Revelation chapter 1, we see that God gives a message to Jesus. Jesus gives a message to his servants, the prophets. The prophets give the message to God's people. And so why should we not despise prophesying? Because when we despise prophecy, we are actually despising Jesus himself. The Bible says that we must test the prophets, not despise them. And so what has any of this got to do with revival? Well, I'm glad you asked. I'm glad you asked. Truly, God's, God's people truly need to be revived. But what has prophecy got to do with revival? I believe it's easier to answer the question if we consider what is a revival and what kind of people need reviving. You see, to revive simply means to return to consciousness or to life, to restore or to renew. And so what kind of person needs to be brought back to consciousness or brought back to life? Obviously, one who is dead, dying, or unconscious. One who is dead, dying, or unconscious. And it pains me to say, but God's people are mostly dead, dying, or unconscious. We need to be revived. We need to be brought back to life. The next question is, how did God's church die? How did God's people die? What was the cause of death? What was on the death certificate? The sad truth is that it's sin. Sin, brethren. Sin killed us. Sin is killing us. Sin is killing the church. And so because of the sinfulness of God's people, we desperately need a revival. 
And so, if sin is killing the church, logically speaking, what has to happen for there to be a revival? What do you think needs to change for God's people to be revived? The truth is that there can be no revival without reformation. There can be no revival without reformation. Reformation simply means to change, to change. There has to be a change in God's people. I, I feel like there is not a single day, a single week that goes by these days where some data is coming into my being, into my awareness, which is just underlining the fact that Jesus is coming very, very, very soon to this earth. The signs of the times all point to this fact that the culmination of earth's history, the whole history of mankind is at hand. God is soon about to pour out his judgments on this planet for the final time. But unlike in the past, where his judgment has always been mixed, diluted with mercy. The Bible tells us that this, the coming judgment will be God's unbridled, unmingled, concentrated judgment without mercy. As with all the previous judgments of God, God has sent his prophets to give a special message of warning and reproof. You see, God does not want us to be partakers of his judgment. The Bible says that hell was made for Satan and his angels, certainly not for God's people. But just as in all the times before, sadly, God's people have despised his prophets and will not heed his warnings. Today, I want us to look at the history of God's prophetic messages and see what we can learn by looking at God's prophetic pattern throughout the Bible. And I pray that by God's grace, we would not only be hearers of the word, but that we would be doers also. Now, I want us to understand the, the pattern of prophecy in the Bible. It goes like this. Whenever God is about to do something major, he always raises a prophet. A prophet that we can call a predicting prophet. Now, this predicting prophet is given a message of judgment with a time element attached. Now, near the end of the time period, a what we could call a reaping or a gathering prophet is raised up. The reaping or the gathering prophet gives the same message, but this time it's a present truth message calling people to respond, to avoid God's judgment. And then finally, those who believe and respond to the message are called out or are saved as a remnant. Now, a couple of extra features you might want to note is that normally always there's an element of delay there's an element of delay. So the time is given and the time comes, but there's normally always some kind of a delay before the prophecy is fully fulfilled. And also the name, the meanings of the names of the prophets are normally significant or relevant to their specific prophetic message. This is God's prophetic pattern. We will see this repeated time and time again. We will consider this pattern through five main events in the Bible. The flood, the exodus, the captivity in Babylon, and Christ's first and second advent. Do you know who was the first prophet in the Bible? Did you know that Enoch was a prophet? Did you know that Enoch prophesied of the flood? In Jude 14 and 15, we read, 
and Enoch, also the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all, and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Before the flood, Enoch prophesied, telling people to repent and turn from their wicked ways. He told them that God was going to execute judgment on the earth. Did you know that Enoch foretold the flood through his son, Methuselah? So some of you may or may not know that. Enoch's name means teacher, and he named his son Methuselah, which can mean when he dies, it shall come. When he dies, it shall come. Evidently, Methuselah's very name and life was a living, walking, talking prophecy of the flood. Methuselah lived until 969 years old. And when he died, in the very year that he died, the flood came. How do I know this, you ask? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let's go to Genesis. Genesis chapter 5, 19 to 24. And Jared lived after he begat Enoch 800 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Jared were 962 years and he died. And Enoch lived 60 and five years and begat Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 300 60 and five years and Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him continuing on in Genesis chapter five and Methuselah lived 180 and seven years and begat Lamech and Methuselah lived after he begat Lamech 780 and two years and begat sons and daughters and all the days of Methuselah were 960 and nine years and he died and Lamech lived 180 and two years and begat a son. And Genesis 5.29 says, and he called his name Noah, saying, this same shall comfort us concerning our work and toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord hath cursed. And in Genesis chapter seven, we read that Noah was 600 years old when the flood of the waters was upon the earth. Now, some simple mathematics, it goes like this. Methuselah's age at the birth of Lamech was 187. Lamech's age at the birth of Noah was 182. And Noah was 600 years old when the flood came. And so if we simply add up the years from the start to the flood, we see that the year that Methuselah died, the very year he died, the flood came, just as his name had predicted. And so God raised up a prophet, Enoch, and he prophesied of a coming destruction, a coming judgment, which would come when his son Methuselah died. Now, prior to this time, God raised up a, a gathering or a reaping prophet named Noah. Now, Noah's name means rest or comfort. And Noah was brought on the scene to declare that the end of the prophecy was nearly at hand. And so he preached with the people, pleading, turn from your sins and live. Was there a delay? Was there, was there an apparent delay in the coming of the flood? Noah preached and preached and preached and years went by and the people began to mock him and laugh and say, you know, bear in mind it had never rained. It had never rained. It seemed as though the things that Noah prophesied would never ever come true. 120 years he preached. But brethren, God's word is sure. God's word is sure. Eventually the thing that God promised did come to pass. Sadly, only a small, small remnant were saved. 
And Noah went in and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him into the ark because of the waters of the flood. Only six people, six people responded to the, the message. Or eight people, sorry, I beg your pardon. And so in the story of the flood, we see that God's prophetic pattern has been fulfilled. God raises up a prophet. He gives a message of warning and reproof with a time element attached. Near the end of the time period, he sends another prophet to declare that it has almost come to pass. There was a delay. Nobody thought it was going to happen. The question is, did it rain? Yes, it certainly did. And all but a tiny remnant of Noah's family was saved. Next up, let's look at the Exodus. The Exodus. Question, was there a prophet who foretold the events surrounding the exodus of God's people from Egypt. There absolutely was. There absolutely was. Genesis chapter 20 verse 7 tells us that Abraham was a prophet. Abraham means the father of a multitude. In Genesis 15 5 it says, and he brought him forth abroad and said, look now toward heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto them, so shall thy seed be. God gives the prophet Abram a message. He says that you will be a multitude in the future. But before then, you're going to spend hundreds, your people will spend hundreds of years in captivity. In Genesis 15, 13, it says unto Abram, know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in the land that is not theirs and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them 400 years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge. And afterward they shall come out with great substance. Abram is given the message that the people will be in captivity for 400 years. God also told him that the Egyptians themselves would be judged. And that God's people would eventually come out with great substance. And so Abraham gave the message, but the prophecy was not for his time. But we see in Exodus chapter 2, and it came to pass in the process of time that the king of Egypt died and the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage. And they cried and their cry came up unto God by reason of the bondage. And God heard their groaning and God remembered his covenant with Abraham and with Isaac, and with Jacob, and God looked upon the children of Israel, and God had respect unto them. Near the end of this period, Moses was raised, and we read in Hosea chapter 12, verse 13, that Hosea refers to Moses as a prophet. Exodus chapter 3, and the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people, which are in Egypt and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters. For I know their sorrows and I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land unto a good land and a large unto a land flowing with milk and honey unto the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. The message to Moses is a repeat of the message to Abraham. God will free his people from bondage. Did you know that the people left Israel on the very day, on the very day that 400 years was up, on the same said day? I mean, read this in Exodus chapter 12. Now, the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. And it came to pass at the end of the 430 years, even the self same day, it came to pass that all the hosts of the Lord went out of the land of Egypt, right on time. You know, the God that we serve is an awesome God, a mighty God. He is not slack concerning his promise, but is merciful. He would do the very thing he said he would do. And so my encouragement to us is, don't lose hope. Don't give up. God will deliver. Interestingly, Moses' name means saved out of water. 
saved out of water. And we see in his life, we see a double fulfillment of the meaning of his name. First fulfilled that he himself as a baby was saved out of water. And then secondly, he himself leading God's people out of Egypt through the waters of the Red Sea. Question, was there a delay? Was there a delay with the prophecy being fulfilled to the Israelites? Absolutely there was. The children of Israel wandered through the wilderness for 40 years. 40 years they wandered before eventually being able to set foot in the land that was promised to them. You see, God had to prepare his people to inherit the land. And also, there were some people amongst the children of Israel who left Israel who were not faithful, who were not faithful, and they could not be permitted to enter into the promised land. I wonder, is God doing the same thing today? As we see the apparent delay, I wonder, is God doing the same thing with his people as we speak? Thirdly, we look at the Babylonian captivity. Hundreds and hundreds of years, Israel backslid. For hundreds of years, God called them to repentance, offered mercy. Eventually, God gave them up to be captives in Babylon. And he predicted that they would be in captivity for 70 years. A proclaiming prophet was raised. His name was Jeremiah, meaning Yahweh casts out or Yahweh strikes out. God's patience had run out. And so God cast the people out to be slaves in Babylon. Jeremiah prophesied that the people will go into captivity for 70 years. The message of judgment is proclaimed, but not only for God's people, but also for the people who kept Israel hostage. We see in Jeremiah chapter 25, and this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and the, these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. And it shall come to pass when 70 years are accomplished that I will punish the king of Babylon. And that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity and the land of the Chaldeans and will make it a per perpetual desolation. Question, did Israel go into captivity in Babylon for 70 years? Absolutely, yes, they did. And was the land of Babylon made a perpetual desolation up until this very day? Absolutely, yes, it was. And then at the appointed time, Daniel the prophet was raised up. Now, Daniel understood that the time was nearly at hand. Daniel's name means God is my judge. How fitting that the book of Daniel is concerned with, above all things, with God's judgment of his people. But not only Daniel, there were a number of prophets raised around the same time, all giving the same message, Zerubbabel, which means out of Babylon or from Babylon. Haggai means born on a feast day or fest festive. And his, his message was all about restoring the feast days to Israel. Zechariah, which means Yah remembers. Ezra, meaning Yah helps. And Nehemiah, meaning comfort or comforter. All risen around the end of this captivity to perform a special work and give a special message to God's people. We see Daniel in chapter nine in prayer, realizing that the end of the time was near and looking for God to do the thing that he had promised. A remnant of the people returned to Israel. Now, notice the delay in the fulfillment of the prophets, of the promise. You see, the people left Israel, left Babylon and returned to Israel to rebuild the, the city. But it wasn't until many years later with the further decrees being given until the work was actually completed. Now, Daniel is a special prophet because 
he is both a proclaiming prophet and a reaping prophet. And so in this particular prophecy, Daniel is the one coming at the end of the time to declare it is coming to an end. The next two prophecies that we will look at, Daniel is the proclaiming prophet for both of them. Christ's first advent. In Daniel chapter 9, we read, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks, three score and two weeks. The street shall be built and the wall even in troublous times. And so the message of judgment is given. The people of Israel have been given 70 weeks, otherwise 490 years to get themselves in shape. But that in 69 weeks or 483 years, the Messiah would come. And so if God is true to his pattern, we should expect that another, another prophet to be raised preaching the same message just prior to Christ's return. Question, was a prophet raised just prior to Christ's return preaching the same message? Absolutely, yes, there was. And his name was John the Baptist. For I say unto you, among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. But he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. In Matthew, it says, in those days, John, in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, John, which is an anglicized version of the Hebrew name, Johanna, which means Yah is exalted. John preached and preached, calling the people to repent. Turn from your evil ways. Turn from your dead, cold, formal religion of works and turn to the living God. At the end of Christ's ministry, after Jesus descended, ascended to heaven, only a small remnant of disciples were, were true to his, his word. If we read in Acts chapter 1, verse 15, we see that there were about 120 people in the upper room, 120 people waiting for him, or ascended together, assembled together, looking at how they were going to respond. What will they do now with the message that they have been given? And if we look at the, the, the second coming of Jesus, also proclaimed by Daniel. In Daniel chapter 7, And I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth before, from before him. Thousands and thousands ministered unto him, and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The judgment was set and the books were opened. I beheld then because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake, I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. As concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and time. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him, and there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. 
again in Daniel chapter 8. And he said unto me, two, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And so beginning in 18, in 457 BC, 2,300 years were prophesied until the cleansing of the sanctuary. Now remember, there is no zero year in AD or BC. And so when the year was 54321 BC, the next year after 1 BC is 1 AD. And if you do the math for yourself, you will see that 2,300 years from 457 BC takes us up to 1844, which is when Daniel said that the cleansing of the sanctuary would begin. My question is this, looking at God's prophetic pattern so far, where a proclaiming prophet gives a time prophecy and then a, a reaping prophet comes near the end of time, the end of that time prophecy to, to warn and proclaim that the end is here. When should we expect to see a reaping or a gathering prophet raised up by God to call the end to the 2,300 days? When should we expect to see this prophet? Really straightforward, right on time. In 1844, God raised a prophet by the name of Ellen Gould Harmon. Later, after her marriage to James White, she became Ellen Gould White. And her names are fascinating. Ellen meaning light, Gould meaning gold, Harmon meaning the soldier of peace. And it's interesting that at the time she was Ellen Gould Harmon. The message that she was giving was to a heartbroken crestfallen church who had expected the second coming of Christ but had misinterpreted the prophecies but the message that she gave was one of peace don't give up don't lose hope Christ is still on his throne and then after marriage her name becomes white which as we know white is representative of purity purity Anyone who has read Ellen White's writings will surely agree that the overwhelming theme of what she wrote about is the urgent need for God's people to submit to God and to purify their characters prior to Christ's soon return. She was given a special message to help God's people in the end of time stand before God to avoid his judgments, which are soon about to come on the earth. When we read Hebrews chapter 8 and 9, we understand that the sanctuary that Daniel spoke of being cleansed was not the earthly sanctuary, but was the true tabernacle in heaven. And unlike the earthly sanctuary, which had to be cleansed once every year with the blood of bulls and goats, the true sanctuary and our true high priest Jesus only once only once has he gone into the most holy place to apply his blood for those people who are submitted and resting in Jesus. So brethren, throughout history, God has consistently sent his prophets to give messages of warning and reproof to his people so that they would not be destroyed, but would have life more abundantly. But how have God's people treated his prophets throughout the years? You know, I dare you, I dare you to go online and to see some of the ridiculous things that are written and claimed about Ellen White. Claims of things that she did or didn't say, or gross misrepresentations of things that she did say. But you know, brethren, worse still, in where we are now, we don't even need to go online to read these things. Because even in the church, even in God's church, people despise and will not heed the messages given through her. So much so, we've come to a stage where it's even controversial 
in the Seventh Day Adventist Church to even mention her name or to refer to her writings. But these things shouldn't surprise us. It has always been the case since the beginning. Jeremiah 7, 25, since the day that your fathers came forth out of the land of Egypt unto this day, I have even sent unto you all my servants, the prophets, daily rising up early and sending them. Yet they hearken not unto me, nor inclined their ear, but hardened their neck. They did worse than their fathers. Jeremiah 35, 15, I have sent also unto you all my servants, the prophets, rising up early and sending them, saying, Return ye now every man from his evil way and amend your doings and go not after other gods to serve them. And ye shall dwell in the land which I have given to you and your fathers. But ye have not inclined your ear, nor hearkened unto me. Howbeit I sent unto you all my servants, the prophets, rising early and sending them, saying, Oh, do not this abominable thing that I hate. But they hearken not, nor incline their ear to turn from their wickedness, to burn incense unto other gods, that this, a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord, would say to the seers, see not, and to the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things, speak unto us smooth things, prophesy deceits, get you out of the way, turn aside out of the path, cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. Wherefore, thus saith the Holy One of Israel, because ye despise his word and trust in oppression and perverseness and stay thereon. Therefore, this iniquity shall be to you as a breach ready to fall, swelling out in a high wall, whose breaking cometh suddenly at an instant. Brethren, I don't know what you see when you look around you in the state of the world, but it's real clear to me, based on the testimony of scripture, Christ is coming very, very soon. And although it seems like we're waiting and waiting and waiting, bear in mind that when you read the Bible, authors, they themselves thought that Christ would return in their lifetime. When you read Ellen White, she was convinced that Christ would return in her lifetime. Yet here we are, hundreds of years later, still waiting. My Bible tells me that Christ is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God loves you more than you could ever imagine. But knowing that many of us cannot, cannot go into the kingdom the way that we are, and so he sends his prophets to reprove us so that we can allow him to change our ways. In the words of Jesus himself, who said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that kills the prophets and stones them which are sent unto you, how often would I gather you, thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Ye would not. What about you? What about you? You know, when some people talk about Ellen White, the kind of things that they, they lead with, the, the messages that she wrote that they lead with are not the messages that she said to lead with. People want to bash you over the head with all manner of different things that she, that she wrote. But the most fundamental teachings that Ellen White wrote about were the three angels' messages. Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens and the earth, the seas and the fountains of waters and come out of Babylon, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins. Now, now, brethren, now is the time to heed 
the words of God's prophets. Now, now if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart. Now, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart. And so my, my call is simple. If it is your desire, if it is your desire to follow all of the words that God has sent to you, and above all, to be prepared to meet him in the clouds of glory, which I believe we shall all see very soon, just, just show me your hands. And if you're on YouTube, God sees your hands. I don't see your hands, but God sees your hands. Let us pray. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so grateful to you. Because, Lord, even in the world of error, you constantly have given us truth for us to follow. Lord, have mercy on us as we have despised the messages that you have given to us to reprove us and to prepare us to meet you in glory. Dear Father, you have seen the hands and you know the hearts. Lord, help us to do the things that you have said so that we may be doers, not just hearers. And Lord, save us in your kingdom, I pray. Dear Father, dismiss us all with your blessings. I pray for those online, those who are listening and watching, wherever they may be. Lord, impress on our hearts the nearness of your coming and save us in your kingdom, I pray, in Jesus' mighty and righteous name. Let the church say, Amen. Amen. I'd rather...